Well, good morning, good morning. Hey, join me in giving our choir a big hand for what they've led in this worship today. Today is a hallowed day. It is a day of worship, and it is a day that is very important for those of us who call Jesus Christ Lord. This is one of the three major days in the Christian faith. And so today, I thought it was very apropos that we would look at the words of our Savior and listen to our Savior as he talks to us about the significance of Palm Sunday. So if you have your Bibles, please take them out with me and turn once again to the book of John. John chapter 12. John chapter 12. And as is our custom here at Kathleen Baptist Church, I want to ask you if you're physically able, would you stand with me as I read our Father's Word? John chapter 12, and we're going to pick it up in verse 44. But before we do, I want to remind you that the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the Word of our God lives forever. So let's dive in. Verse 44. And Jesus cried out and said, Whoever believes in me believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And whoever sees me sees him who sent me. I have come into the world as light, so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. If anyone hears my words and does not keep them, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. The one who rejects me and does not receive my words has a judge. The word that I have spoken will judge him on the last day. For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me has himself given me a commandment, what to say, what to speak. And I know that his commandment is eternal life. What I say, therefore, I say as the Father has told me. Pray with me. Father, we thank you for being who you are. In the span of eternity before creation, you knew this day would come. You planned for it. You shaped it. You brought it to pass. Jesus, you are the focus of this day. Thank you for the words that you have spoken, the words that we're going to look at and discuss here this morning. Holy Spirit, thank you for being the leader of God's church. So thankful that man is not that place. So thankful that we don't turn to man, we turn to God. And so Holy Spirit, as I pray every week, I pray now that you'd speak so that every man and woman, boy and girl in this audience would hear the word of God through his son, Jesus Christ. In your name we pray, amen. Thank you, and you may be seated. So I have entitled this, Jesus Came to Save Humanity. Now in this, in these seven verses, Jesus gives us some deep insight into this truth as to why he came to save humanity. The first thing that he provides for us in this text is the fact that he is God. Jesus is God, and we see that in verses 44 and 45. So let's look at verse 44. And Jesus cried out and said, Whoever believes in me believes not in me, but in him who sent me. Now let's set the text so that you understand where we are in John chapter 12. We're in Jerusalem, we're upstairs, in a house, downtown, it is Passion Week, it is Thursday, the afternoon is moving into the evening, and Jesus is having this dialogue with Jews that have gathered around. Now let me help you understand the significance of where we are. Go to chapter 12 and look back at verse 20. It's a nondescript verse that you could breeze right by, but it's a very important verse because it sets the table for us. Look at it with me. Now some among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. In the Greek, this word Greek is describing non-Jews, Gentiles. Now this is very, very significant because it marks the end of Jesus' earthly ministry. 
It marks the end, and it is now time for Jesus to depart. It is significant because it preps us. Jesus' ministry was for the Jews. And when he died, was resurrected, and ascended to heaven, then the gospel was carried forth to Jew and Gentile. And the fact that Gentiles are seeking the Savior to listen to him is what he prophesied. It marks the end of his earthly ministry. Jesus cried out in this verse. In the Greek, those words cried out mean that he spoke loudly please remember that he had an entourage of between 120 to 200 people that followed him that served him that waited on him that provided for him and the disciples everywhere he went so he had a large group of his close intimate disciples and then he had those that he was speaking to a large throng of people and so he spoke loudly to them and he declares his deity he does this in a way that ties scripture together let's go on a journey together you will need your Bibles because today we will look at a lot of texts so let's go back to page one in the Bible the book of Genesis chapter one and the first few words given to us in the Bible is Jesus ties scripture together for us in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth in the beginning God the Hebrew word Elohim God could have used Yahovah. He could have used Yahovah Yaira. He could have used any number of names that he has, but instead he uses this name. In chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3 of Genesis, God's name is Elohim. It is the masculine plural form of his name, which means in the Hebrew, two or more persons are present jesus is tying in his deity to the fact that he is god in the beginning he's always been god so go to john chapter 1 and let's look at verse 1 we've looked at this on multiple occasions let's look at it again in the beginning was the word and the word was with god and the word was god in the beginning was the word meaning jesus and the word jesus was with god and the word meaning jesus was god jesus was in the beginning with god see his deity being proclaimed by john in the first verse of the first paragraph in this letter that he writes to the church it is beautiful what Jesus is doing here. Jesus is God, and yet he is distinct from God. It is an amazing picture. Go to John chapter 14, just a few verses later, and look at Jesus' conversation in verse 9. Jesus said this, Have I been with you so long, he's talking to Philip, and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? In theological terms, this is homoousios. Homoousios. It means that God is one in substance, three in person. Homoousios. Jesus can say He is God because He is. We see it in the beginning. We see it here in John chapter 1. And Jesus declares it in John chapter 14. But if that's not enough, go to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1 and listen to what Paul says to the church at Colossae he meaning Jesus is the image of the invisible God this is why Jesus could tell Philip have you not known that when you see me you see the father Jesus is the image of the invisible God and he is the preeminent one this word firstborn is a poor translation of the original Greek word it doesn't mean that there was a time when Jesus wasn't alive Many people, many non-believers will say God created Jesus because of this verse. But when you look at the Greek, the word firstborn means preeminent one. It means eternal one. He was before creation because he is the image of God because he's God. Jesus is giving us doctrine. He is God. And so he sets the table with his comments as to why he came to save humanity by declaring his deity. Second, we see that Jesus is truth. Look at verse 46. In verse 46, Jesus says, I have come into the world as light 
so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. Oh my goodness, this is such a good verse. You want to know what's happening in the United States of America today? This verse tells you. Look at the verse with me. Jesus says, I have come into the world as light so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. Do you know who Satan is? Do you? Do you know who your enemy is? Satan is the Lord of evil. He is the arch enemy of God. He is the Lord of spiritual blackness and spiritual darkness and spiritual depravity. Do you know who your enemy is? See, Jesus knew that the disciples he was speaking to, he knew the audience he was speaking to, they didn't truly understand who the enemy was. And many in the church today do not truly understand who the enemy is. Satan is our adversary. The earth that we live on is his realm. He reigns on this earth. Let me prove it to you. Let me introduce you to more detail about who your enemy is. Go to Isaiah, the great prophet, and look at chapter 5. Isaiah chapter 5, and look at verse 20. Here the prophet prophesies this, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Do you want to know why the homosexual movement is all over TV today? I was just watching a doggone commercial last night. Prescription drugs, and you got two men hugging and kissing on the TV screen. Do you want to know why homosexuality is so prevalent? Because we today in America say that what God says is evil is good. Why? Because they're deceived by the evil one, our enemy, Satan, the Lord of darkness, the Lord of evil, the Lord of spiritual depravity. And yet many in the church are calling what God says good, evil. You want to know why the transgender movement is moving so rapidly through our country? You want to know why women are screaming, I don't want to compete against a biological male. I want to compete against biological females. I've trained my whole life for this. You want to know why it's here? Because we're calling what God says an abomination and we're calling it good. You want to know why? In the state of California and other states are prepping to do the very same thing. And praise God, we have a governor that's blocking it here. You want to know why? We have men who are dressed in drag, who are coming to elementary schools to teach our children about that which they shouldn't know, trying to steal their innocence. You want to know why transgenderism is moving so rapidly and is becoming so bold? It's because we are calling what is evil good. Isaiah prophesied this day would come. And we are living in it. You want to know why CNN and other networks mocked God and mocked Christianity when a young woman walked into a school with a rifle and killed six people? Three children, all the age of nine, three adults. And they mocked God and they mocked Christianity saying that God and Christianity was at fault. Because we are now calling what is evil good. What side are you on? The battle is here. And Jesus knew it. And he was telling the Jews then, go to Genesis, or I'm sorry, yeah, go to Genesis chapter 1. Notice in this verse, in verse 46, as you turn there, Jesus says, I have come into the world as light. Once again, he is tying scripture to who he is. He is the light. He is the gospel truth. He is holiness. Pure, undefiled, 
Look at verse 3. And God said, Elohim said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. It is no accident that the first thing God does in the darkness of the world as it existed in that day, the first thing He did was create light. Without light, you can't see. Physically. Spiritually. Jesus says, I have come as light and to this dark world, Satan's realm, so that you might know the truth and so that the truth can set you free. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Look at verse 6. God said, Let light shine out of darkness, has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. The church at Corinth was struggling here, they were struggling with salvation. And Paul is telling them that God has said that the gospel light must come and it shines, it dispels the darkness and it has shone in our hearts for those who have repented of their sins, for those who have confessed their sins, for those who have sought God's forgiveness and by faith have accepted his gift of life through Jesus Christ. The gospel light of truth and the knowledge of the glory of God shines in every child of God through the grace of God, by the mercy of God, indwelling through the Son of God. Paul is communicating to the church at Corinth to remember that. And we would do well to remember that. Go to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. See, I told you you're going to need your Bibles this morning. Look at verse 9. John's introducing Jesus and the doctrine of Jesus Christ. And he says the true light, meaning Jesus, which gives light, meaning the light of salvation and the gospel truth to everyone. Salvation is all inclusive. God does not exclude anyone. This one was coming into the world. He was in the world. And the world, meaning mankind, or which God had made through him, yet the world, mankind, did not know who he was. One of the reasons why Satan is having such a fun time on center stage in our nation, one of the reasons we are declining is because we are declining in our spiritual walks with God. You see, I want to remind you, you're not physical. You're spiritual. You're encased in a physical body. But that's not who you are. If you notice, some of us are red, some of us are black, some of us are yellow, some of us are white. That's not who we are. It is the spirit that dwells within us that God created, that immortal spirit, that is the essence of who we are. And that is what Satan seeks to destroy. Jesus is coming, he's here, he's telling them that he is God and he's telling them the truth that his purpose in being here was to proclaim the gospel and to offer salvation. Third, we see that Jesus saves. Look at verse 47 with me. If anyone hears my words, Jesus says, and does not keep them, I don't judge him, for I did not come to judge the world, meaning mankind, but to save mankind. Notice that Jesus again is stating his purpose for coming to man. What is your purpose? What is your purpose? What drives you? What shapes you? Go to John chapter 3. And let's look at Jesus' purpose more closely. John 3, verse 16. For God so loved mankind that he gave his only Son that whoever believes in Jesus Christ should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send Jesus into the world to judge or condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. Don't ever forget that. Go to Acts 17. And let's continue to look at what Scripture says about our Savior. Acts 17, look at verse 31. 
Because God has fixed a day on which He will judge the world in righteousness by a man, meaning Jesus Christ, whom He has appointed, and of this He has given assurance to all by raising Him from the dead. This is the pivotal foundational point of Christianity. We serve a resurrected Savior. And we have the promise of salvation that tells us that when we die, because God resurrected Jesus from the dead, He will also resurrect us from the dead. It is the hope that Christians have for a future resurrection. It is the truth that Jesus now sits at the right hand of God the Father, and He reigns on the throne of God in the kingdom of God. And He has the position of holiness the position of authority that God has designated for his son alone to possess look at verse 48 the one who rejects me Jesus says and does not receive my words has a judge the word that I have spoken will judge him on the last day referring to the great white throne judgment in which Jesus given the authority of God will judge mankind on that day look at the word again with me the one who rejects me does not receive my words has a judge go to Psalm chapter 19 we looked at this last week we've looked at it on a number of occasions so I'm going to let you read the words on the screen I'm just going to merely point out the adjectives for us The Word of God is perfect. The Word of God is sure. The Word of God is right. Now we need to pause here. You are not right if what you're doing and what you're saying is not the Word of truth. Can I get an amen? Amen. I don't care how right you think you are. You are not right if you are not standing on this truth, living this truth, following this truth. And guess what? Neither am I. I don't care how arrogant I may be. I don't care how confident that I am that I am right. If it doesn't match up with Scripture, I am wrong. And so are you. That's not a judging thing. That is a truthful condition. And it is something that we must listen to. The Word of God is right. It is pure. Verse 9, it is clean. It is true. It is righteous all the time. And because this is true, you can rely upon the Word of God. But because this is true, it is infallible. It is inerrant without any mixture of error for its content. There is no error in Scripture. There is nothing wrong in Scripture. It is perfect, whether you like it or not, or whether I like it or not. When it hurts, He's always right. He, meaning God. And so, it's important that we stand on God's Word. I don't know about you, But I am grateful that God has a standard of holiness called the Word of God. And I am grateful that when I don't match up with His Word, I am lacking and I am found wanting. I don't want to be in that place. And I know you don't either. But I want to remind you today, this standard is the standard by which you will be judged on that final day in glory and so will I. Jesus wants us to know that he came to save the world, not to judge it or condemn it. But he also tells us that the words that he has spoken will judge every man and every woman at the great white throne. Jesus is God. Jesus is truth. Jesus saves. But fourth, Jesus under authority. And we see that in the last two verses, verses 49 and and 50. Look at verse 49 with me. I want you to see as we read this verse, Jesus was not a loose cannon. 
Do you hear it? He wasn't a loose cannon. He had no personal agenda. He didn't give us his opinion in Scripture. He told us the facts of Scripture. He couldn't say whatever he wanted to say. He could only say what God told him to say. Look at verse 49 with me. Jesus says, For I have not spoken, hear this now, for I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me has himself given me a commandment, what to say and what to speak. Child of God, you cannot live on your own authority. Child of God, check your rights at the door because you don't have any. Child of God, are you living under the authority of God? What authority are you living under? You see, in the church today, we struggle with being under authority. Under the authority of God and under the authority of His Word. You see, we'll slander just about anybody if it suits our personal agenda. We'll gossip about whatever we want to gossip about. We'll malign whenever we want to malign, if we choose to degrade ourselves to that level of spiritual immaturity. But notice as a child of God, if you're under the authority of God and under the authority of His Word, when you have an issue with someone, the Bible says you go to that someone. You lovingly sit down with that someone and you talk through the issue with that someone. You don't have the authority to do anything else. And neither do I. In the church today, the universal church, we struggle with this. We want it our way. We want to gossip when we want to gossip. We want to run down when we want to run down. You know the sad part? We'll do it in Jesus' name. We don't have the authority to do that. Jesus was under authority of God and the authority of His Word. What are you under? What authority do you answer to? Jesus was moving through this difficult issue. It is beautiful to see Him navigate this. Go to 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1. And John gives us more insight as to why Jesus could take such a strong, pure, holy stance. That which was from the beginning, meaning Jesus, which we have heard, meaning the gospel message, which we have seen with our eyes, meaning the God-man, which we looked upon and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. Jesus could not do anything other than what God commanded him to do. And I love the fact that Jesus set such a holy standard, a holy model, a holy example for us to follow. Does God mean so much to you that you'll do anything He says? Jesus is such a beautiful picture. Go to Revelation 22. Revelation 22. The final words in Scripture. Look at verse 13. Jesus once again tells us who He is. I am the Alpha and the Omega. The Alpha, meaning the first letter of the Greek alphabet. The Omega, meaning the last letter of the Greek alphabet. A beautiful illustration of the eternality of God. Jesus is the first, meaning He has always been with God. Always, in eternity past, before the foundation of the world, Jesus is the last. Just like God, there will never be a time when He does not reign. He is the beginning and He is the end. This is the God that we serve. Jesus was under God's authority, and it shaped what he did and what he said. Go to Matthew chapter 4, last verse, Matthew 4, I want you to look at verse 17. It was so important for Jesus to honor God and to be under his authority. Notice what he does. This is the beginning of his earthly ministry. This is the first sermon that he preached. Notice the first word in the first sentence of the first paragraph of the first sermon. Jesus said, say it with me, repent. Repent. How important was it for Jesus to tell the truth? Jesus told us 
the only way for you to go to heaven, the only way for you to receive salvation that God is offering through me, you must repent. There are many in the church today who say they believe in God, but they have never repented of their sins. There is many people in the church today who say they believe in God, but they have never gone to God to confess their sins to Him. And they have never gone to God to seek His forgiveness. And they certainly, many of them, have never, by faith, accepted God's gift of life through Jesus Christ. Satan will tell you, all you need to do is believe in God and you'll be saved. You can live a good life. You're a good person. You can earn your way into heaven. God is a loving God, a gracious God. He will not block you out from going to heaven if you say you believe in God. And many in the church have bought this lie, but this lie is not the gospel. The gospel is, according to Jesus Christ, you must repent, stop running away from God, and turn and run to me, Jesus said. You must seek my forgiveness. You must confess your sins to me. It is the only way that you can have a new start. It is the only way that you can be a new creation in Jesus Christ. And Jesus said, by faith, you've got to give me your life. By faith, you've got to be willing to get on the cross. By faith, you've got to be willing to take up your cross. By faith, you've got to be willing to die. What authority do you live under? On this hallowed day, Palm Sunday, it is more than just palm branches being thrown on the road. It is more than just a virgin donkey's colt that had never been ridden. It is more than just people shouting, Hosanna, glory to God in the highest. It is salvation. It is the gospel truth of Jesus Christ. Remember, Jesus is Lord. Remember, Jesus is truth. Remember that He and He alone saves and remember that He's under authority. And by the grace of God, we must choose in humility to be under the authority of God and under the authority of this Word. By faith, you must remember that we are family. By faith, we must live that way. Even when it hurts, even when it's uncomfortable, and especially when it is hard, by faith. On this Palm Sunday, what do you believe? Pray with me. For those in the room who do not know Jesus personally, what I mean by that is you don't have a relationship with God. What I mean by that is if you have never repented, made a decision to stop running away from God and to turn for the first time in your life out of desperation because you've seen the ugliness of your sin, if you've never come to Jesus and fallen before Him, if you've never confessed the sin, the evil, in your life to God if you've never sought his forgiveness and if you've never made a decision of faith to give God your life and to serve him and to accept God's gift of life through Jesus my friend you're not a Christian that's not Mike being judgmental that is scripture and the authority of scripture is what I am bound to and so because I love God and I love you I don't want you to leave deceived. Today God has brought you here. And only you can make it right. Only you can choose. Will you do that right now? Well, I don't know how to pray. Just simply tell God the truth. Tell God you have no answers. Everything you've tried has failed. You have nowhere else to go. Tell God about the evil in your life. Ask God to forgive you. 
and then by faith. Just tell him, God, I don't know what, what it means to be a Christian, but I accept your offer of life through Jesus. And God, I don't know what that means, but if you'll take me and teach me, I'll serve you. But please help me because I need help. My friend, that's where the church will come in. We will come alongside you and walk with you and help you. You will not be alone anymore. Because we're sinners just like you. We have evil in our lives just like you. But the only difference is we have done those things. We've made those decisions and you haven't. Would you change that right now? Would you make those decisions right now? Our group is going to sing in just a moment. And I'm going to ask you to come and to tell me about your decision. I would love to pray with you and encourage you. And we as a church would love to celebrate your decision to repent, confess, seek His forgiveness, accept His gift of life through Jesus. Your decision of faith to give God all that you are. For my faith family, how are you doing? This sermon has spoken to me this week. Me, like you, has areas in our lives where we're not walking under God's authority. Like me, those of you in the room who are like me, you need to repent like me. You need to seek God's forgiveness like me. And you need to confess it and put it on the table and take your hands off of it. And then you need to take action. Whatever it is, whatever the issue is, you need to take action and make it right. Would you do that now? Would you pray and be willing to give God authority in every area of your life? And would you be accountable to Him right now? Regardless of what the sin issue is, would you do that? This platform will be open if you need to come up and pray quietly and reverently. If you want to do that where you are, praise God. Do that right there. I'll be here if you want to come and talk to me. Let me pray for you and encourage you however I can. In order for us to move forward, all of us must repent of our sins and surrender it to God and live under His authority. Oh, faith family, if we'll do this, God will be glorified. Father, in this holy moment, as you speak, I pray that these people would respond in a way that would bring glory to your name. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you for watching this week's sermon from Kathleen Baptist Church. For those that are in our faith family, we hope we can see you again soon. If there is any way we can serve you or pray for you, please contact us at the church office at 863-858-3836. For those not in our faith family, thank you so much for watching today. We would love to connect with you and hear from you to see if there is any way we can pray for you or serve you. We have life groups available for your family to plug into. You can contact us by calling the church office at 863-858-3836 or by going to our website, KathleenBaptist.com. There you can learn more about who we are, find resources for you and your family, see our upcoming events, and watch more of our sermons. We hope you will join us again next week for our service.